Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And Alex, it just occurred to me that there's two of us. Wow. I know. That's news to me, too. <laughs> right, right? I can't believe it. And you know what's interesting is that I've recently been thinking about the idea of running two PCs at the same time because I'm crazy. Because you're so quirky. I am really quirky. There were a couple uh, instances where this happened. Uh, the first time was actually I was playing a video game, and it was called uh, Divinity Original Sin. I know you played the second one, but I'm talking about the first. I think I played the, the, the original Sin. Did you play the original one, too? I think so. The reason I mention it is because they're set up differently. But in the first one, in the first Original Sin, you actually build two characters at the same time when you start. And the two of those characters are actually your main player characters. So they're both integral to the plot. And I thought that that was really interesting because you could make them complement each other or you could make them exactly the same. You can figure it out. Whatever you want to do. Right. Similarly, uh, I thought about this when I started to realize that there is a possibility that uh, the character in my D&D game um, could be lost in a hell dimension for all of eternity now. Uh, actually, a little bit before that, and probably the reason why I was reckless and now he is in a hell uh, dimension full of rainbow colors. I started to think if like, I tr tried a different monk, because I'm playing a monk, but if I tried a different monk build, I had a really interesting idea for a different kind of monk. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I did. And I, I thought to myself, like, I kind of want to play that character too. And it works inside of the fiction that I built already. But then I'm thinking to myself, but I already have my current character. And so I'm, I'm, unless I, I figure out a way to like purposefully get him killed off, which I'd prefer not to do. Or well, I mean, I, you don't have to kill off your character. You can always have your character leave the party. Yeah, that was the other thing I was thinking, like, that he decides, if, if he comes to a resolution, he's like, I gotta go work on myself. I had a um, a cleric that I had do that once. He mm -hmm. decided that he wanted to stay and help where he was, and I didn't want to play the character anymore. So I was just like, yeah, no, he decided that he wants to stay where he is and help the people out here, so he's gonna leave the party. Right, yeah, my, my thought was that uh, there would be a point where, potentially... Uh, Rembrandt would, would kind of go, you know, he's learned a lot, and now he has to kind of go back to Sunscale Temple where he trained, and he's So it's gotta... like a Jehovah's Witness, you get to go out for a year, explore the world, and then you come back into society no, and see no, if you wanna... No, that's the, that's the Amish, that's Romspringa. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door and tells you to find Jesus. Yeah, right, but they like do that bad. forever. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's like a forever gig. No, no, you're thinking you're thinking about the Amish with the Romspringer. They go out into the world and they have a certain amount of time and then they decide if they want to stay in the Amish community or they can go outside. Um, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. The other one's just way more fun to answer the door naked with. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I remember uh, someone telling me about was uh, just go to the door naked, or if you didn't know it was them, um, just ask them if they want to come in and take a shower with you. <laughs> Usually that, does, that pretty much ends that conversation real fast. Uh, so yeah, Rembrandt was thinking about going back, asking a Jehovah's Witness if he wants to take a shower naked. <laughs> and then, no, no, my thought was that he would go back because he needs to get further training because he doesn't he, he feels like he needs more information now that he's been able to go out and that way I could bring him back. Maybe he finds out he's pregnant because he is a mutant. He is a mutant. Maybe the, as a mutant he could get pregnant. I don't and know. And then he's got to go back to the monastery and, and and lay a clutch of eggs and then raise the teenage oh. uh, the and toddler he... mutant Tortolan fighting oh, yeah. babies. That would be that would be pretty sweet, and I could just name them after all the other uh, famous classical painters. Not even classical. Go with a Picasso, a uh, a Monet, a Van Gogh, Rodin. Uh, I need I need a, a Pollock. Oh, a Pollock. Yeah, that would be that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah, Dolly. You gotta do do some abstract artists. Yeah, like Dolly. Yeah, uh, Picasso. Duh. 
Oh, we can oh, get like, into some really interesting ones. That because they're because they're mutants, so yeah. therefore, if their faces are rearranged weirdly, that it makes sense that they're named Picasso. Maybe they actually look like the artists. That would be pretty great. But at any rate, I did start wondering what might happen if you uh, actually built uh, your campaign. Like at the start, you just decided that your players could actually have two different characters that they play. And I don't know how you feel about that. Would the two characters they make be part of the same party? Yes. Okay, because if you did, like, make two characters and we're going to have two different parties. Okay. That I could see as more doable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because having two characters in the same party means that you as a player have to separate the two characters' desires. So they might not always have the same goals. Mm -hmm. And they definitely don't have the same... Uh, character knowledge as each other so that's a lot harder for people to separate out that's true. so if you go well if you were to say rembrandt wants to do this thing and has this goal if your other character doesn't have that same goal but they're still pushing for rembrandt's goals it's like okay well that doesn't really align with their character but they're doing it because they're both your characters trying to get this one agenda achieved yeah, and I, I guess the other thing that I realize might be a problem is, knowing me, there would be long conversations I would literally have between my two player characters. Yeah, and that's the other thing, too, is, is how, do you, how do you figure out, like, the interactions between the two? Now, you do bring up something very interesting. Um, what if you did have two different characters that were in two different parties? Ooh, or... If you were actually playing, like, uh, the good version and then, like, your evil version that's in, like, an opposing uh, team. Like, almost see, like your shadow team. See, that also raises the questions of who you're rooting for more because you can play into your own hand. Yeah. That's, yeah, like, that's, that's like playing against yourself uh, in a game of Magic the Gathering where you've got your nice blue control deck here. Yeah. And you know exactly what you're playing against, so you're like, oh, well, I'm gonna play this, and the other one's like, haha, well, I'm gonna counter that spell, because I knew you were gonna play it. <laughs> right, but then on the other hand, you could say this, you could say this, that since you are uh, theoretically on both teams, you don't necessarily have a bent as to who you want to win, because you would win regardless of who was actually making out. In that situation. I, I think if you're going to play two characters in two different parties like that, you'd have to have a different dynamic of what's going on. It, it wouldn't be, like, opposing, because then it's mm. like, all right, well, I like this party more, so I'm going to try and sabotage the other party in that party. Like, right. do things to sabotage itself. Mm. Which you may do, unless you're really good at being character, and like, yeah, no, I'm going to play this character as if their goals are the ones I want to go for. Which is right. fine. Some people can do that. I don't think everyone can do that. It is a lot harder to put aside the one uh, party in an idea for the other one, too. It's why you don't see as much of the two-character thing going on. Right. Um, but you could always do it in a way like, well, we've got time shenanigans or whatever, for instance, because we've talked about time travel, where you could do yeah. uh, one party is at this period of time, and it affects the things that the other party has to deal with, perhaps, but right. it wouldn't be immediately relevant. You wouldn't be like, all right, so we're doing, we're going to go save this person over here. And then in your other party, it might be like, oh, well, since this person was saved or was not saved, it has an effect on the, the storyline that they're dealing with. Right. Right. Um, what, and that would be interesting because it'd be cause and effect there. Right, right, right. I, yeah, I could also see, like, if you had, like, a long-range puzzle, one of your characters has to achieve a certain thing for it, for the other character over here to actually continue that part. Uh, like, like, in order to get past the door, you have to be able to, you know, break the orb, but this character over here is on the quest line in one part where they're doing the orb, and, and the other character can't progress. You could kind of do that duality. I've seen puzzle games that are like that, for, like, co-op, where you have those two yeah, kinds of Yeah, you could, you could do something like that, too. Mm. Um, but then you have to figure out how you pass information between the two parties, or the two right. characters, even. Uh, it, it, would, uh, it would either be like, oh, the door's down, and you'd be like, I guess I know what I'm doing now. 
Or you'd have to keep sending ravens and owls, depending on what kind of what bird. What Yeah, or a pigeon. What a hoot. Whatever flying bird carrier <laughs> device you want to use. Um, I guess the thing that I was thinking about, like, you were, you were talking about keeping different information separate for different characters. The thing is, is that, like, doesn't the GM technically do that with, like, 50 different characters? Sometimes. You know? Sometimes. I mean... Yeah. In what way? You know, if you look at like what a what a GM a DM usually has to do, they have a ton of different NPCs, and the world is built up quite a few that have pretty refined uh, backstories and histories and certain knowledge that are are contained inside each one of those NPCs. So it's sort of like you know, since they're all part of the world, they still have to kind of be fleshed out characters. So I kind of feel like when you're a GM, you kind of already have like 50 player characters. So I kind of felt like it doesn't feel so bad to say that uh, maybe my players have I mean, two each. Yes and no, because usually your NPCs um, aren't fully fleshed out in most cases. Like you're not going to flesh out every single peasant and shopkeeper that people are going to deal with. You don't know. It's like me. they don't need a f they don't need a full on backstory if they're not going to be integral to I, the story. I make one um, anyway, <laughs> unless you're crazy. <laughs> well, um, that's why I made one. <laughs> well, yeah, but like like you're not doing a full character sheet, for instance, for NPCs typically, unless they happen to be like a big bad guy or a big NPC that you might fight with or something, somebody like that. That's you know going to be impactful because then you actually have to know like like if you're doing it. In a way that you want it to be very story rich, you would want to be like, all right, well, what's their motivation? What's their background? It'd be like character devel development for a novel or, or uh, a yeah. movie or something. Yeah. You'd want to know what th is going on behind the scenes with this character as your uh, DM, so you can decide, like, all right, well, what would they do in different situations? Mm -hmm. Unless they're like a dragon, then it's just like, oh, well, it's a dragon, so you might just be like, they just kind of want to burn down villages, eat sheep, and get lots of gold. That could be their mm -hmm. sole motivation. They may not need more character development than that. I I want my uh, dragons to be very character rich myself. <laughs> I want a dragon like in Dragonheart. Yeah, I want dragons to be complex. the The other thing, though, is uh, like when you're a GM and you uh, end up with an NPC that actually becomes part of the party um, itself, like a like a follower kind of deal. Sort of like that. I'll give you an example, actually, from the D&D game I was playing, um, because we... Actually, I can give you examples from both of the games that I've been playing. Uh, but in the D&D game, so Dom, uh, at one point, we got waylaid by a bunch of, uh, like, orcs and stuff on the road, or bandits. We had one that was still alive, and it was a bugbear, and his name was Formica, uh, as we found out, and we questioned him. And uh, so uh, over the course of a couple sessions, uh, Formica just kind of threw in with us. He was tired of, like, you know, working for the bandit that he was working for. And uh, Dom had a whole character sheet for him, put, put a whole character sheet together for him. Uh, and he fought with our uh, party. And, and inevitably, we got him killed. <laughs> because, because, of course, we were bound to get him killed. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But, you know, it wasn't for lack. We did try to save him. We tried real hard. <laughs> we failed. In, uh, in Andy's game, where we're playing in 1879, uh, one of the characters that's actually with us the entire time is we have a guide. We're, go we're in South America. We're looking for a, um, like a Mayan step pyramid. Oh, fun. Not a Mayan step pyramid, but a step pyramid nonetheless. And so we do have a guide that is with us the entire time. Now, theoretically, he doesn't know how to do the stuff where he fights. So, uh, so he's just kind of ancillary, but he is a character that is, uh, continually doing the literal guidance for us, uh, through, okay. through this. So, so give him, a, uh, give him a shotgun. Okay. And. Done. And then you don't need to know how to fight, you just gotta pull a trigger. You know, I have a spare weapon. I could give some, I could give the guide something to, to use. Give him a shotgun, yeah, so, because you don't actually have to aim a shotgun, you just have to point it in the direction of the thing you're killing. That's true. That, that's that's why shotguns are, are not ballistic skill weapons in most games. They are point-and-shoot no. weapons They, in they most are games. close quarter. They are close quarter weapons. <laughs> get, get as close as you want to them, aim it, point it at them, and then pull trigger, and bang-bang. There's a reason it works for birds. 
because you can yeah go you you go right ahead you try to use your long rifle to shoot down a bird i mean you can if you're good you but again can. that's a ballistic skill then not it's just a hey look hard. i'm going to scatter this area with pellets yeah anyways yeah. um <laughs> So yes, a guide like that, for instance, uh, I've had a DM NPC in a party that I had because we had three players in my party, mm-hmm. and none of them were fulfilling a role for a healer, which, yes. again, isn't really a big deal, but it was like, all right, well, there's only three of you, I need to round the party out just a little, because mm-hmm. none of you are really spellcasters, right? and none of you are spellcasters that can help, so I was like, all right, well... I'll oh, none of you out. were spellcasters. Oh, okay. I think one of them might have been a bard. So one of them, none of you were spellcasters. <laughs> so so the, the bard is a spellcaster and does get a healing yeah. spell, but it's not really their forte. So it was just kind of yeah. like, all right, well, I want to give you guys a character to help out, to, to kind of um, go along with you, to help you out, to right. kind of not telling you what to do. But it was a cleric, it was a dwarven cleric, and he had taken a vow of silence. So it was... You're not going to get any information from this character. He's not going to talk to you or, or, or interact with you in any real meaningful way. Mm. He'll help you smack things with a mace once in a while and cast spells for you. Okay. I think I actually used him once because I threw him up against a enemy that I didn't realize at the time none of them could kill. I think it was a swarm of something in like 3.5 and it could only be hurt by magic. It couldn't be hurt by physical damage and none of them had spells. Oh. I was like, oh... Oops. Oops. All right, hold on. And I'm looking through the, the cleric spell list really quick. I'm like, all right, so I'm going to use summon, I think summon celestial animal or whatever, summon nature's ally. Yeah. So he summoned a, uh, an owl. Mm-hmm. I think it was a swarm of locusts. Okay. And they couldn't be, couldn't be harmed by any, like, yep. any physical attacks. It had to be something magical or non, yeah. you know, non-magical, but elemental. And- this isn't Fallout. We can't, you can't just hit the swarm of bees. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. I just went, all right, well, he's summoning a, a celestial owl, and this counts as a extra planner creature, so it's magical in effect, but it's going to just eat the locusts. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, I, I get that, I get that. I was like, oops, my bad, guys, I didn't realize you actually couldn't do anything about this, right. that is my bad, and mm-hmm. I shouldn't have done that. I Now, the question I had, so the dwarf had taken a vow of silence, did any of his, his spells require a uh, verbal component? You know what, probably, but <laughs> at that point, I think yeah, I whatever. just, like, I went, you know what, he's a cleric, his his spells are from the divine and the divine yeah. says you take a vow of silence right. then the divine is gonna say but you can still cast your spells i mostly care because i play a shadow monk and therefore i have a silence spell so <laughs> things like this do do apply to to me in thinking yeah. about this he, he, so so he didn't have any um verbal components to the spells okay. that he could do but yeah. like he could still cast his heals and stuff so That's otherwise okay. i mean if it was like a, an attack spell that would have taken a verbal component. Yeah, no, he wouldn't have been able gotcha. to. Yeah, I guess that was the other big reason, though. I should say the other big reason why I was thinking that it might be useful to think about or even try to figure out a way or or special rules to do multiple PCs for a player is if you just don't have a lot of players. See, here's the other example. There, you can always, always as a DM. Figure out ways to get around these things mm. if you don't have many players. Uh, the game that I had a long time going with uh, David Somerville and Bo right. Severson was yeah. majorly just Bo and I as characters. Yeah, just the two of you. Really, just most two of, of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we had a couple. We had uh, Kyle Farron, the artist for Vast, uh, or sorry, uh, Vast and Root, yep. who joined us for a little bit. Yeah. Um, we've had a couple other people that had joined us for small stints. I never did. No, but the majority of <laughs> you wouldn't have me. <laughs> the majority of that game was just Bo's character and my my character with NPCs and other stuff going on. Yeah, and it was just the two of us, and it was a bard and a druid. And you weren't necessarily really good at being a bard or a druid. Well, and you were okay at a druid, but but he like wasn't Bo's- a very he wasn't a good bard. He was actually a really good bard, but he was more of a I hit you with my sword bard than right. a I sing a song at you bard. Right. But like the character was really good. That's yeah. just what his character was. And my druid was just a 
very good at not being a socially acceptable druid. Right, I understand. Also that. a lycanthrope. Yeah. But, like, we only had two players and two party members. And it's like, we didn't have to have extra party members. Both right. of us could heal a bit. Both of us had a lot of utility. And, uh, theoretically, your challenges just don't have to be as hard as if you had four or five members of your party. And that's part of the thing, too. It's, David didn't pull his punches with us. Mm -hmm. There were several times that one of us had gone down in a fight, and the other one was just like, oh, shit, shit just got real. All right, yeah. let's go. <laughs> yeah. So, we would run away, and we would come yeah. back later, and we would have to deal with the ramifications if we ran away from a fight. Yeah, and we had that happen several times. But it's like, mm -hmm. here's the deal: as as players and as characters, know when to run away, know when to live to fight another day. You don't always have to death or glory every fucking monster, every boss that you fight. We do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My party, but does like every you, single and a, a lot of parties time. do that, and it's like we're not going to back off. And Bo and I would play off really well with each other because it's like, all right, we're overwhelmed. We can't yeah. do this. Yeah. So, like, there was one where I think he had gotten knocked down, and I went, oh, crap, we're getting overwhelmed. There's way too many, I think it was a town. The guards are all over us, knights and everything. And it was like, all right, so I'm going to grab him, pick him up over my shoulder, because he's, he's a half-orc, I'm a dragonborn. We're both, like, six feet plus, you mm -hmm. know, beastly monsters of men. Yeah. And so I grab him, throw him over my shoulder, and then turn into a horse and ride the hell off. Yeah. That's a, so that's I've a got him idea. on me, and it becomes a chase sequence of me getting out of town with him on my back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which was really cool, but it's like, all right, David's like, I didn't expect you guys to get out of there alive. Right, right. It's like, no, no, we got out of There are so many situations where we got out of things that David didn't expect us to because we weren't just going to sit there and, and fight. Mm -hmm. You were going to, you know use our brains and even the one time i actually my character did die i i'm pretty sure i've talked about it before but uh my druid i was uh we were separate mm -hmm. we were doing different things uh i think because at the point in time we couldn't make the game together so we were doing one-offs when the other one wasn't available and yeah. so um david had this thing going on in a uh where this demon had been attacking and killing people in this thing, and I was trying to look for this, uh, trying to look for a person, and w in looking for them, I came across this. Mm -hmm. And my druids, basically, his, his background was that I can't let people just die for the sake of dying mm -hmm. kind of deal. Like, I'm not gonna, that's not kosher. Um, but also, with what we had decided on my background is that the creature that was there, I recognized it as an ancient enemy from my homeland. Mm. So I was like, oh, I've heard of these. These are things that I don't like. Mm. I'm like, all right. That, I'm like, do I think I can take it? And David's like, no. Would that, <laughs> would that check you made? Do you think that thing is way more powerful than you? I go, cool. But my my actual personality traits and my flaws and the stuff and my background, I'm like, right. but there's no way I'm not going to try and take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I... I 100% went into that fight knowing my character would die. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, there's no way that my character would back down from this. It's like, it's an ancient enemy, and just the way I've rolled my character up is he would go straight at this teeth barred. Right. So I did. And I died. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, your self fulfilling prophecy there, that's, uh, that's something. <laughs> oh, no. It was like, yeah. oh, man. It, it was a monster that no way that. Hef could have taken on his own. Right. Yeah. And it wasn't designed as a fight that I could have taken on my own. Right. But yeah. I was like, David, I'm like, I can't not. Yeah. So I'm like, I know it's going to kill my character. I'm 100% certain that this will probably kill me. Yep. But I have to take it. And I we dealt with the ramifications later. And uh, Bo actually used his bard. He found a, a way to get me resurrected. Nice. Um, yeah. But in doing so, we, he, we went around, away from the town. And we had to deal with the ramifications of uh, the other person gaining more power and doing really nasty stuff in the city mm -hmm. uh, that we had to come out and we came back and, and killed him. Right. And, right. and where, saved, the, saved the city. But the point is, um, you deal with the ramifications if you don't have enough party members, too. Right. So, right. like, yeah. you can do the let's have another PC thing, mm -hmm. and that's fine. 
Uh, sure. But you can also deal with a party that's smaller and just figure out ways to get around some of those parts. Just to give you an idea, uh, our party is like six players. So basically, we figure that we're pretty much invincible in almost every situation. <laughs> like, like for instance, a, a Shadowfell dragon swoops down from the sky, wants to parlay, and we're like, okay, we'll listen to what you have to say. And it starts talking about how, like, more important than the law is the law of war. And so we've taken your land, and then our, like, priestess and sorceress are like, nope, screw that, and just start firing at it all over again. Yeah. And, uh, and then as a shadow monk, I, like, shadow step onto its back and, like, hi, I'm gonna ride you now. Every situation. But there was one time where me and our barbarian were actually separated from the group. We went out late at night to do some scouting missions. And before you know it, there were these creepy kids... But but I was like, oh, you know, we need to lay low for a while. Just show me where you and your sister live, and we'll we'll go. And we get like taken down into like a, a basement. These these kids are really creepy, and there's like papers hanging from the wall, and they don't like the light, and they want it dark all the time, and something. So you found the goth weird. kids. Got it. I found we found the goth kids. And then, like, as, as we're going through, and they want us to go through and close the door behind us, I'm like, I'm not letting them close doors behind us. And before you know it, I'm like, okay, we don't want to do this. And it turns out that all of these kids were, you know, there, there was like a glamour. You know, they were, they were made to look like kids, but they were actually, like, horrors <laughs> underneath that. And uh, they come at us, and it was the one time where I was like, yep. We're out of here. We're heading for the door. We we like we like got through the door. Um, turns out that my barbarian friend actually can like do a little bit of ice magic. Like it's an ancestral ancestral barbarian. Uh, like got you. freezes freezes the door shut, and we like run out of there as fast as we can. But see, this is where I kept saying like you know strength in numbers. Why I always want to do more PCs. All I did is I get out there and um, I like hail the town guards and talk about the creepy kids that are in the basement. And, and I think these are the people that you were looking for earlier. Like I tried to make it look like that. And I got like half of them killed when they went down. <laughs> but we, but, but hey, we got it cleared out eventually, you know. Yeah, see, it's interesting to have stories told that you don't always win or that mm -hmm. you don't always face head on too. Right. Because... In running away from that fight, you had something else happen that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a story of, oh, we're the heroes, we went in and we took care of this evil yeah. or this bad thing. Yeah. It's, we couldn't really overcome this, so we got help. Right. Um, that was and, 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 and honestly, I think there needs to be more of those stories in D&D &D and other RPGs, because yeah. a lot of it is just, oh, you're the heroes, you can take anything on. It's... Mm -hmm. really cool to feel that way but at the same time it's it's the same idea that there's great story uh opportunity and failure uh so hey there's always something to think about if you're worried about not having enough players uh Failing? just you fail you failed you, you you're gone maybe you die well and that's the thing not every failure is a complete failure a failure right. can result in a success in another way Right, you do figure that with RPGs you're going to have some measure of failure, otherwise why roll dice at all? Right. You know? And that's the thing, it's it's using your failures to tell stories too. Um, right. Which is harder, because I know we all want to win, mm -hmm. and we all want to succeed. And yeah. that's one of those harder things for, I think, uh, a typical player to deal with. Right. Like, I know I have definitely been like, oh man, I wish I had done better on that role or it's like yeah i totally yeah. totally hit that creature yeah, yeah. i uh, wish i, shit, I no. wish i actually did something right that would have been great mm. but then the but the, the the other thing is is though sometimes when you fail so horribly it makes for some great moments the the crew at one point was trying to figure out was making a wide berth around like these glowing sprites what what were apparently like a field of glowing sprites uh, and they they were kind of like, let's just get around it. And I decided that I would try to make like an insight check, which I'm bad at. And so I rolled a one and I had a negative one to my skill check. So I got a zero. 
Um, nice. And so what Dom decided to do is Rembrandt thought that those glowing sprites were party mushrooms, and he ran to try and eat them. I mean, it seems accurate. Also, yeah. I think a natural one is a critical failure on a roll, so... Yes, it is. Um, it is. Yeah. And if, if, you, Usually, if you roll a critical failure and you have a negative to your stat check, it's not See, my, my favorite thing is, like, a perception check or a stealth check that you fail. And it's like, I want to sneak. I'm like, okay, roll the dice. And they're like, I'm pretty sure I fail. I'm like, how how bad do you fail? They're like, I roll a five. I'm like, okay. You think you're sneaking really good, guys. Yeah. You think this <laughs> is going it's like, great. You, you don't know you fail those things. Yeah. It's like, you you're not, your character isn't going to know, like, oh, I'm sneaking. All right, how good are you sneaking? And you're like, I'm sneaking so on point. I feel like I'm invisible right now. Yeah. And you're like, you rolled a five. You think you're sneaking great. And you could roll really well, too, and it doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> that you're going right. to overcome the and I mean, your failure might not be as much of a failure if the NPC fails harder than you do. Yeah. But, like, That's it's really fun. I, I I started doing that after a while. It's like, do you uh, succeed or fail? It's like, I'm not going to tell you if you succeed or fail this role. Right. It's like, your character doesn't, doesn't know. I'm like, you as a player might know. Right. But your character has no idea. Fair it's enough. like, oh, can I try it again? No, you're sneaking great. You don't think you're doing a bad job at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you try and sneak harder? You're already sneaking hard. <laughs> you gotta sneak hard, folks. Spy hard. I'm gonna make my next character like Leslie Nielsen. To, to get back on track, though, kind of take this thing home. If you were interested in building a system where you actually accounted for having players playing multiple characters, what kind of rules would you want to put down for that? Oh dear, I'm not even sure. Yeah. That 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 would be a difficult system to actually yeah. mitigate for. Yeah, like if you were actually um, building a system in the intent that char- that that players would actually play two different characters. I would almost feel like it had to be a a pretty straightforward symbiotic kind of relationship where one character's skill set almost has to complement the others. Or what they do has to resonate in what the other character does. Like, or, or they have to be mirrors of each other. Like, they, they would have to be like Superman and Bizarro. I think if you wanted to do it, you could do something in the way that for every success one character has, it means the other character has a failure or something oh, like that. That dude, could be really okay. interesting. Yeah. So it's like you have to balance that out. It's like, I succeed here, but that means the next role is like, if you succeed in action here, it means the other character is going to have a failure. Right. right. So I think if you balance it out like that, then it could be really interesting. Yeah. Because you've got this, it's a symbiotic relationship of, of luck, essentially, at that point. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, you can succeed or fail with this character, but if you fail, the other character will succeed at the next thing they do. And if you succeed, the next thing they do will fail. Right. Vice versa. Right. Which could be really interesting. I'm not sure how it would play out, but it's a really interesting thought mechanic right now. Right. It would also make your roles much more uh, complex because really you don't necessarily... I- I'm-, I'm trying to think you'd have to almost choose. I think the big thing for you would be since since whatever you roll, it's going to be kind of good and kind of bad. You'd be choosing like which one of your characters is actually making that role. I think depending if they were in the same party or not, yes. Yeah. Um, if you had them in different parties, what you could do, I think at that point, is say you make one role mm. and you look at the role and then say, all right, I don't know if this is a success, a success or a failure, but I'm going to either take this role for this character, or this role goes to the next character's next role. You could also do it in a way where, imagine you have, like, red team, blue team, right? Uh, so you're, you're actively currently following blue team. Now you're rolling for your character on blue team, and depending on how well all of that goes, it will automatically translate to how well red team's doing. And uh, the better the blue team's doing, red team's uh, failing. <laughs> so now when you go over to red team and you play, like, next session, you're in red. Now if you're rolling, you're already coming in at a disadvantage. Right. But if you come in and you, you end up succeeding, then that's great. If you end up completely flubbing it, if you beef it bad, then yeah. blue's just going to be in a much better position when you go back to them the next day. Almost like you have two parties that are are like on a race for your life sort of scenario like they're trying to 
accomplish the same thing, but they're fighting against each other to get there first. Right. Almost like mm-hmm. almost like that, like a chase, like a, a race to get to the thing. It's like a Scooby Doo, uh, the car racing Scooby Doo one. Yes, yes, yeah, it is. It's Wacky Racers. That one. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Snidely Whiplash. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna get them dogs. Okay, yeah. So uh, anyway, if anybody wants to try and make the Snidely Whiplash Wacky Racers game, that's this is where that duality really helps out tremendously. There you go. So there's something you could try. I don't see it made as any kind of rule sets or any special rule sets, because I guess they, I suppose that it would be basically the same kind of rules as making a single character. You just have one person playing two different characters at the same time. But uh, like you mentioned, there are some drawbacks to that, too. Right. I think if you if you figure out a good way to do it, it could be interesting, but it would be a very balance needed Thing. Oh yeah. Well yeah, you're you're right about the whole thing where you'd have to determine which character is going to actually do what because otherwise you might just try to stack the deck. For one I mean, character. absolutely. Uh, if I were going to make two characters to complement each other, absolutely the deck would be stacked. I'd be like I'm going to make an illusion bard mm. or an illusion mage or something like that, like a, a a wizard that focuses illusion for instance. Right. And then I'd be like and I'm going to make an assassin. Yep. So my wizard is going to cast these illusion spells that make it so my assassin just walks in and murders people. Right, yeah. You make one character that's just going to make the other character way, way more awesome. And then, it, it, so, so basically you have the, like, the throwaway character, this is the, your support character, here's your main character who's going to be so much cooler now that you have this support character. And you just work for yourself the entire time. Yeah, there's a, there's a problem. I guess you'd have to know your party, and you'd have to know your players to make sure that that doesn't happen. But I don't know how you GM it either. It 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 would be a it would be a test. If you ever try it out, let me know. I'd like to know uh, how that worked out, and uh, and if you have any tips for actually running a campaign. Like if you are uh, like a, a person running a game, and uh, you only have one player. <laughs> If this is that whole thing that Gary Gygax did with the the one member of the staff where he was running through the temple of elemental evil, if you want, if you have like a player, and they want to play a few different, they want to just play the party. How does that end up working out? Um, yeah, I think in that case though, it really was just one uh, player who was playing one character, and yeah. I don't know how you get through the temple of elemental evil. It- you burn the temple down. Oh, yeah, I guess that is pretty easy. Just do that. Yeah, I mean, it's elemental evil. You might have to use holy fire or something like that. Well, whatever works, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just get to you, Matt. Half of it's down. Half of it's down. Well, I think uh, we've explored uh, our own duality and the, the duality of role-playing in this episode. Woohoo. Woohoo. Uh, and, and we've d- explored our own duality because a lot of people don't know uh, we are being played by the same person. We are. Yeah. It's God. Yep. We are puppets on a string, and God's moving us around like marionettes. Mm, do, do, sounds do, about do, right. Do, do. Yep. Or it could be Satan. You know, that could be the duality there, too. Oh, can you imagine if you played God and Satan at the same time? That'd be pretty sweet. I mean, yes. Yes. I imagine this. That's the new odd couple, by the way. We need God, that show. Didn't you write a? Didn't you write a? a I did manuscript about this one I, time. I wrote a series of short stories that were about um, what if God and Satan had a competition to see who was better at being human. Sa- Satan won, right? Um. Well, it they had a series of competitions. So sometimes God did better at certain ones, but like running for politics. Yeah, uh, Satan did better mm. at that. When I had them on a reality show, uh, Satan did pretty well on that, too. <laughs> that, um, was, yeah, that was yeah. pretty good. Uh, do you still have that kicking around somewhere? Uh, yeah, I should have those stories kicking around somewhere. So if anyone uh, listening, if anyone does listen and wants to get at those stories, I'm sure Nathan can provide you with that. Yeah, I wrote about, um, when did I stop? I probably stopped after about 10 or 11. I don't think I went back to them. Number eight interestingly enough, was a whole thing where I explained the reason why God created the universe. Oh. There's, that was, that was a whole story. I did a, Cheap tricks, I assume. Um, no, no. Actually, in some ways, for atonement. 
It's. Yeah, I thought. Well, I thought that was an. Interesting you're gonna have to read episode eight. Yeah, you're gonna to find have that to, one out. You're gonna have to read fourteen billion BC. That was the. That was that one. But um, I haven't looked at those in so long. I wrote those a long time ago, folks. Yes, very long time ago. Yeah. Uh, however, if you were interested in uh, seeing anything more recent that we have done, Alex, where could they go? You can go to delvecast.com. That's right. Uh, we have some articles. I'm actually going to be releasing my updated journal for my character in uh, 1879. Uh, because I've been keeping a whole journal of our uh, time in that game. I've had a fun time writing out his journal as a like a sardonic Irish uh, inventor. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm going to try to keep that updated if anyone's interested. Uh, as well as videos that I've been doing and uh, our our podcasts, obviously. Hopefully Orbital will be coming back soon. I am writing something right now. Uh, while you are on there, if you can click on that Patreon banner, you might be surprised by what you find. Uh, because we do a whole bunch of things for our patrons, including extended episodes of these very shows. Uh, unedited, uncut for for the people who like your media raw for people who like rambly bits in in their podcasts the thing about it is is that when i originally got into podcasts i would listen to interviews that did kind of just go on and they were they had a lot of time to breathe and i kind of like that but now i do like ones that feel like tighter and more um refined which is why i do do editing on podcasts now but right. um, but yeah, so my tastes have changed too. But I know that there's a lot of people that still love to listen to those longer interview talking oh, yeah. points. So good news, we do have them. And uh, I think the last one we did was actually about 30 minutes longer than the episode that you got. Yeah, that happens. Uh, thank you to our Shiny Level patrons, by the way, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. And uh, if you want to, you can also follow us on a whole bunch of social media stuff. Uh, our Facebook group, or you can find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Dell Podcast. So follow along there, and you can get all of the stuff that we do all the time, <laughs> because we, we do it. still post a lot of stuff, folks. And so, for all of us here at Delve, uh, both of my characters and both of Alex's characters, all four of us, thank you for joining <laughs> us. And we will all see you on the next one. Bye. Boy. Bye. Bye. That's the that's the take. That's there you the go. good stuff. <laughs> all right. You know, some people really do. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of podcasts that just talk and talk and talk and have people just talking. Oh boy. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's my alarm. That's okay. Um. We can edit that out. <laughs>